Okay, I just finished reading Thriller Bark. And look, after finishing Post Anislavi, I was ready to head over to Fishman Island, but I am so glad that instead we got sidetracked into like One Piece's version of the Bermuda Triangle. And this place lives up to expectations. Like, what is this creature out in the darkness that just looks at you with its beaming eyes? You could totally see this as like this mysterious thing in the world of One Piece, but I can also see it being indicative of like some unknown island in the same way that those giant shadows appeared uh, back in Jaya. But even the explain things are really fascinating to me. Like when we end up getting swept up in what appears to be a floating moving island, which conceptually already pretty cool. But then the Riller Bark manages to explain itself as a gigantic ship. Seriously, I think what I love about the Riller Bark is that it's essentially just an entire Halloween themed saga where even the architecture of this place, the villains, the settings, all of it plays into the theme of horror. The whole zombie grunts and the main baddies all looking like vampires. And to top off this like Halloween themed arc, we get Brooke who is a skeleton. And look, at this point, I'm already like, okay, I'll just accept anything that comes this way. I mean, if Frankie was a cyborg and he hasn't even eaten like a robot fruit or anything, then I think I could just accept a random skeleton existing without any rhyme or reason. Like skeletons exist in the world of One Piece? Yeah, sure, whatever, that makes sense. But the fact that we got like a revive fruit, what's essentially a second life is fascinating because it implies an afterlife and also ghost in the world of One Piece. Like sure, Perona could control ghosts but I could have chopped that up to it being a one-off fruit ability. Here though, we have two examples of ghosts and how ghosts operate. Like ghosts don't just leave and then come back instantaneously. Like Brooke's ghost was stuck searching for his body. This fruit has terrible consequences. Either, either way, it's weird. It's also weird that Brooke was aware of what devil fruit he got when practically nobody else who has gotten a devil fruit has known what their devil fruit was going to be. So just instantly a ton of questions on Brooke and Brooke was really charming. Just went out of the way to answer almost every question, even the ones that he probably shouldn't have. But for me, what makes him go from like good to great is his connection to Laboon. Like, can we talk about Laboon? I think what I understand about Oda is that he tends to foreshadow something out there and then not mention it for like over hundreds of chapters. So for example, we learn about the Grand Line, but we don't go there until like a hundred chapters later. Same for Alabasta, we heard about it, but we only saw it about 80 chapters later. We learned that Luffy was going to return Shanks' hat and that still hasn't happened. And so, I mean, I guess, yeah, there was this sort of expectation that eventually we were going to get to see Laboon again, the submarine whale. But I didn't know when it would happen, and moments like this, where Brooke just mentions wanting to go see a whale and being unable to, instantly connects the dots, and kind of makes some of the things that we've seen make a lot more sense. Like everything around Brooke is centered around the story of Laboon. Like when Brooke is fighting his own shadow, he mentions the value of his hair, and we're told that not just because he likes his hair, but because it connects Brooke to Laboon. From a story perspective, he isn't just like a musician for the sake of it, but we get to see this element connect him to Laboon. And what has Luffy wanted for a while now that we've heard him talk about for like the first hundred chapters of the story? A musician. This might have been like one of the few beats that I think were like planned from the start since Luffy just couldn't stop talking about the musician at the start. Since, you know, we gotta like meet up with a submarine whale at some point. Which means one of the things that Brooke is going to have to do if he wants to go visit Laboon is defeat his own shadow. And can I just say, shadows confused me because I think someone in the group said that like the swordsman was from Wano and since the swordsman has Brooke's shadow, I thought that meant that Brooke was also from Wano and they just had like the same skills and thoughts as the swordsman, but that didn't seem to be the case. So I had to reread that a few times to understand what was going on. From what I understand, the shadow takes the skills and emotions of the shadow giver and places it into a body that also has its own emotions. So there are like two pilots controlling this meat mech. <laughs> When Luffy gains a shadow ability, it's still Luffy, but he also gains the skills and the temperament, at least from his facial expressions, of the shadow giver? 
Like Sindri has both the body and the mind of her old self, but is also half piloted uh, by this other woman who used to hate plates or whatever, as well as being controlled by people who command her, which creates three different contradictory autonomies. And that control over someone's autonomy and just disregard for someone's life is what angers Chopper so much. It's such a like blatant disrespect over the ethics that Chopper has put himself on as a doctor. Like, Chopper instantly flips from like, oh, you're not actually trying to help the living. This isn't like you using your abilities to help others. It's just a self-serving cause, which then creates a nice payoff to see Chopper finally take this guy down. Which admittedly, again, they, they look like a bad guy. <laughs> Just from like a character design perspective, you could not see this guy walking around in plain daylight and be like, that's the good guy. Anyways, we we're trying to figure out the shadow thing. Hopefully I got that right. And it matters because when Brook is fighting the swordsman, he mentions that the swordsman might use certain abilities, but doesn't understand the reasoning behind them. And following that, when Zoro steps in and challenges the swordsman instead of Brook, we see that while Brook's shadow is what gave the swordsman life, it's really the swordsman who's the one in the control of this fight. Zoro isn't fighting Brook's shadow, he's fighting the Wano samurai guy. And sword fights are always fascinating to me in the world of One Piece. When Zoro was fighting Mihawk, there was almost this level of understanding between swordsmen. It was less of a fight with hatred and intent, but rather a match against a skilled opponent, where even though they're fighting each other to death, or close to that, there is still this strange level of respect that I don't see in any other fight. When Zoro wins the fight against that like Wano samurai guy, it's not a moment where Zoro just gloats about how amazing he is, but rather this like respectful, almost disappointment at the fact that he didn't get to fight the guy in a more even circumstance. It is beautiful. I don't see that in like Sanji's fight, really. That's more of like a simp battle. That's it. That's all I got. I don't I don't know how I feel about a simp battle. I mean, that along with like Sanji wanting a fruit ability that makes him invisible, that has like bad connotations with your track record. It, it's weirdly thematically appropriate that in an arc focused around autonomy, the person who actually takes down Absalom is Nami herself. On the complete opposite spectrum of that, again, is in Usopp's fight. Though I really actually enjoyed this one a lot. Usopp is just weaponizing arrogant pessimism in order to win this fight. Like Usopp's entire model was, you can't make me depressed. I'm always depressed. <laughs> What a bold fighting strategy. I also love Perona's gimmick, not only because it's using the seat like Usopp is, but also the ghost mobility and the fact that she's like mocking Usopp throughout the entire fight is amazing. Like for half of the fight, she is just taunting Usopp. So this entire fight with Perona is essentially just a battle of negativity and trickery. It's where we see Usopp utilizing a lot more things in his toolkit, using things that we saw like back in Water 7 and Alabasta. Even at Usopp's lowest point where he's doubting himself, we again see the use of the Sniper King. This almost like weird way of dissociating your perceived worst aspects and quite literally just Making it until you make it. Usopp just starts doubting himself and Sniper King's like, no, you got this, buddy. Just uh, take her down. And her reaction to all of this just made the fight even more memorable to me. We also get the introduction of Shadow Luffy being placed in this huge monster because on the one hand, that thing looks like a horrifying creature just lurking over everything as it goes around just destroying the entirety of Thriller Bark. But on the other hand, it's still Luffy's shadow and there's like this weird juxtaposition of seeing this huge monster wanting to sail the seas, which is pretty dumb. Like I kind of want to see what would have happened if he succeeded because other people would certainly just be scared of that thing. And in that entire fight, I think I just want to emphasize this one panel from that fight with Shadow Luffy. Not only because I think it would have been really awesome if this happened, and I really wish this happened, with, with all of the members just combining together into a mech Power Rangers style. But also because even if they didn't do it like this, they all work together to take down both Shadow Luffy and Moria. 
And that is a pretty important theme for Gecko Moria's story. Like, Gecko Moria, along with Crocodile, were both pirates who wanted to become King of the Pirates. Countless characters have mentioned that trying to become King of the Pirates is like climbing a metaphorical ladder to the top. And most of them eventually get shut down once they hit a ceiling, with it resulting in almost all of them falling back down. With like Moria and Crocodile specifically both falling down that ladder and instead becoming one of the seven warlords of the sea. It seems like the first half of the Grand Line, even though it's hard and the Straw Hats have come close to death one too many times, is also the easier half of the Grand Line. Like, Gecko Moria did everything right. They had, like, a strong crew and strong ambitions. They had even more people than Luffy. And they still lost to, um, Kaido in Wano. So Gecko Moria is seen as, like, this reflection of what could have happened to Luffy if he fails to become King of the Pirates. Not just, like, getting injured like all the other times before, but actually seeing all of his crewmates just die in front of him. It seems that Gecko Moria has been building anticipation to climb the ladder once more, this time going out of his way to remove mortality from the equation. Maybe thinking that the only way to succeed isn't with a strong, loyal crew, but rather through, like, obedient creatures. Because the former didn't work! And I guess the end of Thriller Bark kind of implies that that's not the case, with a Straw Hats beating Moria as a sign of success through teamwork and shared strength. At least it would have been if not for Kuma, because after all they did in NS Lobby, they're not gonna get away with it. Now the whole world government has a stern eye on the Straw Hats. The world government has elected Blackbeard as a showcase of who's gonna be the next Warlord of the Sea, as well as sending Kuma to prevent any more warlords falling. So what what do you do? Like the whole expected theme was that like, no, the straw hats are different because everyone is working together and they're stronger as a unit. And sure, maybe in a 1v1 against Moria that works, but now you're also up against Kuma and you're too weak to carry on. So while Zoro ends up taking almost all of the inflicted pain as a trade in exchange for the safety of the crew and doesn't even let anyone know about it, which I mean, I'll just point that out. I don't think I need to say that that's a good scene, but we like we know it's a good scene, right? My question is what does that imply for the rest of the new world? Because I think that it's showcasing that one, yes, despite this, the crew is still the deciding factor of whether or not they'll survive. But also two, yes, they're going to need to get stronger within the next few islands or they're not going to make it to the new world. And what keeps grabbing my attention though is like just how close we are to the new world and just how much we're being introduced to like so much of the new world. We're being told about like Kai from the new world as well as like a samurai from Wano as well as like these papers that are exclusively used in the new world that we didn't even understand all the way back in Alabasta as well as like how much characters have been mentioning the difficulty of the new world so I think again it's establishing a lot of the major themes for the next upcoming arcs what will make the straw hat succeed in a way that Moria didn't and of course, of course, finally, I need to mention Ace of Blackbeard. Look, I, you know how I mentioned that, like, I thought I knew that, like, Oda really loved to delay things. Like, we mentioned the whole Grand Line situation, but not seeing it until 100 chapters in, right? Well, I thought that was going to be the case with, like, Ace and Blackbeard. Like, I talked about it a little bit in post Lobby, but I thought that Ace was going to capture Blackbeard and, like, bring him to a Whitebeard and Shanks. But instead, we have the opposite situation where, like, Ace is dying. And so, like, now what's going to happen? Are they going to, like, steer over towards Ace? Like, they're just going to beeline it towards him? And also, what about Shanks and Whitebeard? Do they also see Ace's paper burning up? And are both of them also going to go to Ace? Because, again, even with this, like, huge hint, the exact details of what's exactly going to happen are still kind of blurry. And I love it. And I have, like, an entire bingo card here. And I'm just hoping I get at least one of them right. There we go. Can I just say how satisfying it is to say Thriller Bark? Like the names for these arcs have gotten weirdly good because you could just say like Thriller Bark and it feels, it has like a half to it. How do you come up with, the, how do you come up with those title names? Huh? Such a good name. They're such good names.